If you want the absolute best gaming experience, for $1,600, you can get one of these, an RTX 4090 graphics card. And if it fits and can be powered by your current PC, you'll have the best possible performance money can buy. Or if you just want a good gaming experience for the same $1,600, you can buy all of this and build a complete gaming PC and setup. So that's what we're gonna do today. And because in over 30 years of building PCs, I've never done it, this will be an all Intel gaming PC. Let's do this. It's the money. Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ and the cost of PC parts is going up with top tier graphics card costing $1,600 or more, which for a single component really isn't attainable for the majority of people. And it's not really supposed to be. An RTX 4090 isn't for everyone, but that's also not to say that if you have the money and PC gaming is your passion, you shouldn't buy it. I mean, you do you. I'm just here to help guide the undecided in finding the best value when it comes to PC gaming and tech in general. So today I'm going to demonstrate what you can get for the same cost of the current best graphics card, which happens to be an entire gaming PC complete with peripherals. The plan is to go over the parts I selected for the build, assemble the PC, connect up all the peripherals, and then play some games and see how it does. Now, in my experience, which is actually backed up by sales data, the most sold pre-built gaming PCs cost between $1,100 and $1,200. That's what the majority of people are spending on a gaming PC. So that's the price target I'm going with today with the goal of building a well-balanced, strong 1080p to introductory 1440p gaming PC. Let's get into these components and since this is an Intel build, let's start there and I guess I should just start with the graphics card selection, which is the brand new Intel Arc A750 limited edition. For those who need to know, the specs are on the screen, but what I'll say about this GPU is that in the pre-launch reviews, there were some problems, mostly driver related, but this is a retail card that I found at Micro Center for the $189 MSRP, so we'll get a chance to see if any improvements have been made now that a few weeks have gone by. I'll also say this card is, in my opinion, gorgeous. It's one, if not the best looking cards that I own. Sleek and clean design, quality materials with simple branding, just a simple white LED logo text and small chrome accents. It should look great in this build. I'm pairing the Intel GPU with an Intel CPU, the i5-12400, six cores, 12 threads and plenty fast and just $175. As a rule of thumb for me, the most expensive component in a gaming PC should be the graphics card. Nothing is gonna improve your gaming performance more than the graphics card. So that's why I'm not spending an extra $100 on say the 12600K or even more on the brand new 13600K. Keep in mind, while you might see a five, six or more percent performance boost when pairing those CPUs with top tier graphics cards, scaling the GPU down also scales down the performance difference to basically nothing except in the most CPU bound games. Now, if you're watching this in the future and the i5-13400 is available, that should plug right into the system if the price is appropriate, that is. Moving on to our last Intel part, and we have a one terabyte 670p NVMe SSD. I went with this because the price is good, but mostly because if I said I was doing an all Intel build and didn't use it, I'd get beat up in the comments. This is a Gen 3 NVMe drive, which honestly for a gaming PC isn't a big deal, but I'll leave alternate Gen 4 drive recommendations in the description. For memory, I have 32 gigabyte kit of Trident Z DDR4 3200CL16. It's G skill because while Intel makes memory, it's not the kind for gaming PCs. 32 gigabytes because another rule of thumb for a gaming PC is two gigs of RAM per CPU thread. And since 24 gig kits aren't really a thing, well, anymore, we round up. The cost of DDR4 and even DDR5 is falling, and this will only cost you about $114. We're strapping all of that to this Asus Prime B660MA D4 motherboard. 
The Prime Series boards have always offered really good feature sets and reliability for a good price. And oh yeah, surprise, this is an MATX build. MATX has always been my favorite form factor and MATX boards have typically had all the features you need but not the extras you typically don't. So they cost less than an ATX board, but they're not super compacted and therefore costly like mini ITX. Next, while you can cool the 12400 with the included Intel stock cooler, I'm gonna upgrade a little and go with this deep cool AK400. I picked this cooler up to use for my case reviews and it's just been impressive. And at just $34, it's a great value. Powering the system is a Corsair CX750M. I have a ton of power supplies, but I keep coming back to this for my mid-tier builds. It's a 750 watt PSU, 80 plus bronze rated with a five year warranty. It's semi-modular with nice black cables. And I'm pretty sure the CX series is made by Seasonic. All of that in just about 85 bucks. And I almost forgot, I also have a one terabyte SanDisk Ultra SSD, which will be my game library. I could put the few games I play the most on the NVMe drive and the rest on this. Finally, the one thing that was provided for this build was the case. Inwin sent over their new A3 Micro ATX case. They actually sent it to me for review, which I will be doing a full review of the case, so be sure to get subscribed for that. But today we'll get a review preview. I'm pretty sure the MSRP for this is about $90, but it only comes with one case fan. So Inwin also sent a three pack of their Mercury case fans, which I'll be using. So that brings the total cost of the PC to $1,121. So I met the price point there. Let's get it assembled and then I'll go over the peripherals. Build complete, it came out great, no major issues. I do like this case, maybe not the fan so much. Anyway, like I said, full review is coming. To complete this build, we need more stuff. This stuff. For a display, I'm going with this Scepter 32 inch 1440p 144 hertz monitor. I've actually been using this monitor with my gaming system for several months now, and I really like it. Good sharp image, great refresh rate, low latency. It's not a top tier 1440p display, but at just $279, it's one of the price to performance displays available. Now, the keyboard, mouse, and headset are all from Rocap. The keyboard is the Vulcan TKL Pro, a 10 keyless deck with cherry red switches and low profile style keycaps. You get a selectable dial and all the RGB goodness gamers love. $100 for the keyboard. The mouse is the Burst Pro. It's lightweight at 68 grams, has Titan optical switches, a 19K optical sensor, and according to my son, is the best drag click mouse there is. I think it's great because it's on sale right now for just $40. For audio, we have the Elo X headset. It's a wired headset, it's lightweight, good sound, detachable microphone, and again, on sale for just $30. Now, in the original plan, I was going to go with the Elo 7.1 Air wireless headset, but I decided not to restrict the audio to just a headset, so I used the $30 price difference to add this simple sound bar. Nothing fancy, it has Bluetooth or wired options, not a huge sound stage, but for consuming media, watching a YouTube video or something, it works, and this brings the grand total to exactly $1,600. Mission accomplished, an entire gaming system for the cost of an RTX 4090. But how does a game? 
Well, I've seen the problems with especially older games on the Intel Arc, and personally, I play older games. In fact, I'm currently playing through the Bioshock series. From there, I plan on moving to Mass Effect for like the fifth time. So I'm gonna start there and move all the way up to the pre-release Modern Warfare 2 campaign. Let's play some games. Like I said, I like to go back and replay older games, but with remastered graphics at higher resolutions, I'll start with Bioshock 2 at 1440p, and I'm turning on VSync because that's typically how I play, and I want to see if input lag or stuttering is a serious issue with the Intel GPU. Also, please forgive the camera work here, but my capture card doesn't support 144Hz pass-through. So jumping in, the FPS stayed locked at 144, with frame times pretty consistent between 6.4 to 7.4 milliseconds, so no stuttering and input lag felt exactly as I had expected to on this older game engine. For Mass Effect, I used basically the same settings, and while playing, I did see some small drops in FPS with tiny spikes in frame times, but it was nothing I even remotely noticed while playing, so there were no issues that affected gameplay for me. For The Witcher 3, I turned off VSync and went with 1440p Ultimate, and in this game, I didn't quite hit the 60 FPS mark, which is okay at these settings, but not okay was the significant spikes in frame times, and I definitely noticed the hitches and roaches giddy up, with 1% lows dipping into the teens. Now, the one game many reviewers had problems with was CSGO, so I gave it a try at 1080p medium, and while the FPS did seem a bit low and 1% lows were also probably low for these settings, for the most part gameplay was fine, however there were occasions like this, where the frame time spiked, FPS bottomed out, and the resulting stutters and latency made it impossible. Just occasional problems like that in a competitive game like this is a reason not to go Intel graphics if you're a CSGO player. Staying in the competitive shooters, I jumped into Fortnite 1440p high preset with DirectX 12 enabled. One thing I noticed was that in the first few second frame times were all over the place, but did quickly settle with occasional spikes of no more than 2 milliseconds. You'll also notice that I fixed the Intel performance telemetry on the upper right of the screen so you can see GPU stats now. Next was Apex Legends. I started with 1440p high presets and we essentially stayed at the game's 144 FPS cap with very smooth gameplay. Of course, you can expect this to drop a little in gameplay outside of the training course. Removing the FPS limits and dropping to 1080p and the gameplay was excellent. Overwatch 2 1440p Ultra and gameplay wasn't excellent, but it wasn't horrible. The 1% loads were relatively low, and there were times where the frame times trended up, and the FPS did swing from the 80s to the low 200s, and this did introduce a bit of latency, so while this is okay for a casual player like me, probably not so much for more competitive players. I tried to test Warzone, but this game has just become ridiculous, and after waiting forever, I just got sniped out of the sky twice, so here I am just trying to run around the lobby, and again, frame times are okay, probably a little too erratic here for competitive play, and I'd expect closer to a steady 144 FPS for a mid-tier PC like this. Back to more casual gameplay, and Borderlands 3 at 1440p high is usually pretty choppy on low to mid-tier hardware, but was super smooth on the A750. Great average FPS, consistent frame times with no micro stutters. The same went for Doom Eternal at 1440p high. The FPS swung a bit more, but this is typical of this game. Frame times were consistent, and I didn't have any problems with Vulcan on the ARC graphics. For God of War, I played at 1440p high, but I wanted to test out FSR 2.0 on the Intel graphics, and it actually worked pretty well. I did notice the slight loss of fidelity as opposed to native 1440p, but nothing that distracted me from the game, and again, gameplay was smooth and consistent with pretty good average and 1% FPS numbers. 
Finally, I'll close with the pre-release Modern Warfare 2 campaign. Again, I'll play at 1440p, but with this game, I can test Intel XESS, which I set to performance. And at first, everything seemed okay. Graphics were good for the normal preset I selected, FPS was good, great frame times with good 1% lows, and no stutters or lag. However, luckily, I already played through some of this game on my slightly higher end RTX 3060 Ti system, because when I got to this level, I noticed it was snowing and it's not supposed to be snowing. So I turned off XESS and after restarting the game, it wasn't snowing anymore, just a slight drizzle like it should be. It appears that XESS was upscaling the drizzle or atmospheric particles. Another thing I noticed was XESS really didn't have any effect on average FPS, but it did keep the frame times much more consistent. Okay. That was fun, but my preliminary impression is art graphics still need some work and probably aren't ready to be adopted by the masses. I kind of suspected this would be the case, which is one reason I didn't spend even more on the A770, plus the small performance difference between the A750 and A770 would be even slimmer paired with this hardware. However, most of the games I tested were not just perfectly playable, but great gaming experiences at 1440p, which is still impressive for a sub $300 graphics card. Now, I'm not giving Intel Arc a final verdict. I still want to stick my RX 6600 and RTX 3050 in this system and see how the three GPUs compare in a realistic gaming system. I also want to see how the A750 performs in non-gaming workload. So stick around, get subscribed, ring that bell for more on the Intel Arc graphics. And if you have any questions about this setup, be sure to ask in the comments and I'll see you in the next one.